In this problem, we have three ropes that are supporting a strut. And the three ropes are under tension. They've got tension, we'll call it T1, T2, and T3. And I'll label these accordingly, T1, T2, and T3. And the strut itself is incompressible. It's under compression because of the three ropes that are under tension. At the base of the strut is a ball and socket joint. And this joint is a lot like the joints in your shoulders or in your hips in the sense that they allow the strut to rotate freely, but they prevent any translation at the base of the strut. So here's the actual problem statement. What we know is that the compressive force on the strut due to the ropes is 400 pounds or 1800 newtons. And ultimately what we're trying to determine is the tension in all three of these ropes. Here's a simulation to give you a feel for the geometry. We can look straight down or look to the right. If we look behind the wall a little bit, it just gives you an idea. And, and here, as we zoom in on it, is that ball and socket joint, allowing the strut to rotate freely in this joint, but it prevents it from moving up and down or left and right. To solve the problem, one thing that we'll need to know is the geometry of what we're dealing with. If I look at the side view, what I find is that the strut extends outward by 6 meters from the plate, and if I look at the front view, if we look straight down on it, we can get the geometry, and these are all in, in meters, where I've got the center of the strut here, the top of the strut is two and a half meters above the center of it, and we know the three cables, this cable is one meter to the left of the strut, it ends three and a half meters above the base of the strut, or we could say three and a half minus two and a half, or one meter above the tip of the strut. The third cable is five and a half meters downward, and it goes into the screen by six meters. So that gives you an idea of the geometry of the problem. And we also know that the tension in each of the three ropes will act along their axes. To solve this problem, one thing we need to recognize is about the strut itself. And at the base of the strut, the ball and socket joint could impose forces in any particular direction, in theory. And at the top of the joint, we could impose any particular set of forces, in theory. However, if I look at this, I'll delete these arbitrary ones. Convince yourself the only way that this linkage could not rotate, it's a stationary linkage, the only way it could not rotate is if the forces on the strut either act directly towards each other or if the strut was under tension directly away from one another. What is not allowed would be some force configuration like this because in this instance, about the center of the strut, I now have a counterclockwise moment, and it would suggest that the strut was accelerating or rotating counterclockwise. So for a static situation, this is not possible. So what we do know is that the resultant force from all three of these tensions acts in a direction that is down the length of the strut. And to balance that force, the ball and socket joint acts to the upper right also along the length of the strut. And I'll give that a name. We'll call this vector Fs for the force acting on the strut. And this incidentally is known as a two-force member, where I've got the force on the strut is the resultant force from all three of these vectors, and then I've got the force acting at the ball and socket joint. So a two-force member, the two forces either have to point directly at each other or directly away from one another. So here I've included the slide view and the front view so we can get an idea of the geometry. But one thing to note is that the force on the strut in, in vector form is going to equal the sum of the forces of all three tensions. So T1, the vector sum, T1 plus T2 plus T3. Because they're vector sums, we need to find both the magnitude and the direction of the force on the strut and all three of the tensions. So let's start out with T1. And I can write the vector T1 is equal to the magnitude of T1 multiplied by the unit vector, which gives us the direction in which T1 is acting. In this unit vector, we can use the fact that the tension has to act along the length of the rope to calculate the unit vector. We'll draw a vector from the tip of the rope, where the tension starts, to the end of the rope at the wall. So we'll say R1, this vector R1, which just describes the displacement from the beginning to the end of the rope, we'll say is equal to delta x i hat plus delta y j hat plus delta z in the k hat direction. And to do this, I first need to define my coordinate axes. So I'll have x, y, and then using your right hand rule, we'll make sure that the z axis is coming out at us to make sure that we've got a right hand coordinate system. So there's the, uh, the right side view, and I'll do the same for the front side. 
and for the front side I've simply rotated it 90 degrees counterclockwise vertically so now the x-axis now sticks out, the y-axis is still up, and the z-axis is pointing to the left. And if I drew axes on this one I would have the y-axis acting vertically, the z-axis acting in that direction, and the x-axis would be acting out at us, so x, y, and z axes from that perspective. So the first rope moves in the negative x direction from the tip to the uh, end of the rope, and it moves by a value of 6 meters in the negative direction. So we'll say r1 is equal to the initial position, we'll just say x equals 0 minus x equals 6 meters. So in this case delta x is moving 6 meters in the negative x direction. And in the y direction, its final value of y is 3.5, and, and its initial value of y is 2.5. So I'll say 3.5 3 minus 2.5 meters in the j-hat direction. And in the z-hat direction, our initial value of z is 0, and our final value of z is a positive 1 meter to the left, or positive 1 meter in the z-direction. So we've got 1 minus 0 in the k-hat direction. So here's a value of r1, but ultimately what we want is a unit vector acting in the direction that the tension will act. So u1, the unit vector 1, will be r1 divided by the magnitude of r1. And when I calculate the unit vector for the first rope, I'll get this value, which has dimensions of meters, divided by the magnitude of r1, which also has dimensions of meters. So this unit vector is a dimensionless quantity. All it does is gives us the direction in which the tension for rope 1 is acting. So if we multiply it by the scalar, the magnitude of the tension, we'll get the vector, the actual vector, for the tension in rope 1. Once you've calculated the unit vector, it's often a good idea to check your work. So I'm going to take the magnitude of the x, y, and z components of u1 and calculate the magnitude of all three of those. And what I do calculate is a value of 1.000 to four significant figures. So it looks like I did do my math right, and the magnitude of the unit vector is indeed 1. So now that I know the unit vector for the first rope, I can take that unit vector and multiply by t1, and I just I come up with a vector quantity for t1. And I did the same thing for the vector for t2. t2, for example, moves in the negative x direction from the tip to the base of the wall. It moves upward 2 meters in the j-hat direction. We go from 2.5 meters up to 4.5 meters. And in the k-hat direction, in the z-direction, it moves in the negative direction to the right and moves 3 meters to the right in the z-direction. Divide by the magnitude of that, and here I get a vector quantity for t2. And I did the same thing for t3. So finally, we need to remember that the force on the strut is equal to the sum, the vector sum of t1 plus t2 plus t3. So we also need to write the force on the strut in vector form. And as we discussed at the beginning of the screencast, because it's a two-force member, the force of the strut has to act along the length of the strut itself. So just like we did with each of the three ropes, we can calculate the force of the strut. Here's the magnitude of the force on the strut, which we know is 1,800 newtons. Then we just calculate the position of the strut and divide by the length of the strut itself, or the magnitude of the position of the strut. If I move it down below just for a little bit more room, what we'll find is that the meters will cancel, and we're left with 1800 newtons times these parameters, and here's the, the final vector for the force on the strut. What I can do now is write three equations with three unknowns. If I start with the i-hat direction, I'll, I'll underline all of these in blue. The sum of these three has to equal the resultant force acting on the strut, simply because it's acting down the length of it. And I can do the same thing for the j and the k-hat directions. When I do that, here's my system of three linear equations and three unknowns. So here are my three terms for the i-hat directions, and my three terms for the j-hat directions, and my three terms for the k-hat directions, written out in matrix form. Here's my i-hat direction for the resultant force, along with the j and the k-hat directions. And when I solve this system of equations, what I find is that t1 T2 and T3 are equal to 760, 290, and 1100 newtons.